Greeting to each and every one of you. I am Scott Adams and I'm here to speak with you today on Scrum Team Diversity and Inclusion. Unfortunately, I don't have a PowerPoint for you, which is okay. Because I am of the adage that the power is in the point. Hmm. I'm sitting down, typically I normally stand up for these type of conversations, but I wanna try to make it as intimate as possible. I want you to think, hey, we across the street having coffee. Well, you know, I'm having a bottle of water. I don't really drink coffee. You know, I am in North Carolina, it's hot. You know, if I drink coffee, I will begin to sweat. So no, you have your coffee or tea. I'm gonna have my water and let's dive into it. I think it's a great time. I believe it's an awesome time to begin to have the conversation about Scrum Team diversity and inclusion. Now, before I get into that, I think it's great to establish what that definition of diversity is because it could be different for some people. So I went to Oxford Dictionary and got this excellent definition. Diversity is the practice or quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds, different genders, different sexual orientations. Oxford Dictionary. Now let's take a look at inclusion. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Well, I love this definition. I really couldn't find anything that really wanted that fit with this talk, but I found something. Check this out. Inclusion refers to how diversity is leveraged to create fair, equitable, healthy, and high-performing organizations or communities where all individuals are respected. They feel engaged, they're motivated, and their contributions towards meeting organizational and societal goals are valued, valued. That definition comes from the Global Diversity and Inclusion Benchmarks Standards for Organization Around the World by Julie O'Mara and Alan Richter. Since 2020, the beginning of 2020, I'm speaking of last year, I realize we're in 2021. There's an awful lot of things that have happened that have uprooted our lives, literally uprooted. And I want you to take a moment today and think about, have you considered about the impact that all these things may be happening on your team, your group, your scrum team, whatever that may look like? And I want to identify some of those instances that, and dive a little bit deeper into it. One, we know about the racial injustices resulting from the loss of lives being witnessed and recorded by individuals including children. Have you thought of the impact of that on your team? Now, some of those witnesses to those events could be right there on your scrum team and you have no idea. How are you gonna manage that? Unfortunately, this past weekend, I'm a little bit sad today because one of my good friends actually committed suicide. I did not see that coming at all. Perfect life, perfect job. Just talked to him last week. Everything was great. I got the news last night when I got off a training call. Did you hear so-and-so die? Like, how did he die? Committed suicide. Wow, it was floored. Some of these witnesses could be on your team. Now, we do know a little girl recorded some of those events. She's little now, let's say five, 10, 20 years from now, what if that person gets on your team? You don't know. The pandemic, let's take a look at that. The pandemic impacted everybody across the world. Some people didn't get a chance to say goodbye to their loved ones. Those people may be on your team. They will be on your team. They probably are on your team. That was a worldwide impact. Didn't get a chance to say bye. I got to log on to this computer and act like I'm okay and do my job or I have to go into an office building, correct my face so I can go in the office and do my job. 
I, ladies and gentlemen, can relate to that. I have a lot of practice in that way before the pandemic in terms of saving my face, forgetting about everything else that just happened and I have to show up to deliver whatever it is I have to deliver. But I'm thinking about these folks in the pandemic who have lost a loved one like that. That's never happened to them. But I'm thankful to God that I have this opportunity to say, hey, to be empathetic and sympathetic to those who may have some similar feelings, but yet not know how to deal with those feelings. These are some things that you're going to experience on your team, be it a scrum team or not. How are you going to handle that? Have you pondered the question of the impacts of not being diverse? A lot of great articles came out last year. CNB, uh, CNBC.com did a great article with through Citibank, the Citibank Group. And the title of that article was Racial Inequality, the Cost of the Economy. That number was staggering. That number was $16 trillion that we have lost over the course of 20 years, two decades, by not being diverse. Now let's put that in perspective. Most of you probably familiar with a company called Apple. Apple is a $1 trillion company. Putting that in perspective, we could have 15 more companies the size of Apple if we was more diverse. As I was researching that topic for this here presentation, I, was, I wanted to ask the question to Google. I had a theory. I asked Google this question. Does facial recognition recognize black people? I was expecting maybe a hundred hits. But do you realize I got 40 million, 700,000 hits on that one question. Why did I ask Google that question? Cause of diversity, not enough diversity. Last time I was on an airplane, February of last year, I was in Detroit, Michigan, coming through the airport. And <clears throat> this hat is what attracted me to a situation that was going on there. Uh, there was a black man going through the checkpoint and facial recognition did not recognize him. He is darker than I am. Other security mem members was around. The, the situation was getting pretty tense. I had a another plane to catch because I'm trying to get back to North Carolina. I am in Detroit, Michigan, a long way from home. But I felt that I needed to do something in that particular moment. So I walked over to him. You know, this is part of my fraternity as well. As you can see in the back room, I went over to him, I hugged him and I whispered into his ear, bro, calm down. It's okay. This is the hat that he had on his head. I said, I need you to calm down. It may look like discrimination to you, but it is not. I am a professor at Wilmington University here in uh, the United States in Delaware. I teach computer science for the simple fact that I'm looking more so trying to get more diversity in this industry. There is a shortage, yes. I told him all this in that brief moment. I said, look, I need you to calm down because I want you to get home, get to your family safe and sound. This, in this case, is not a discriminatory act. This is a problem, a big problem. And I gave him the example, say, you have an iPhone right there. A lot of us have iPhones. I asked him, say, do your, your, the facial recognition on your iPhone recognize you? He said, no. Now, everybody else around us looking at us like, you know, who are these two people talking, two strangers talking, every, you know, you know, the police officers, security guards, they're all around talking. And they look at us like, okay, what's going on here? They talk, have a conversation about iPhones and computers and stuff. So he said, yeah, I got an iPhone. I said, does the facial recognition on an iPhone recognize you? He said, no. I said, Facial recognition is only 80% accurate. The darker you are, is definitely not gonna recognize you. 
I say even I have the same problem. Women are included. Still talking about diversity. So he said, hey, man, what can I do to, to show, show you my appreciation? So I'm going to take this hat. And I said, I want you to come back and get your hat. Whenever this pandemic is cleared up and we're going to have a different conversation. He called me last month and we're going to see each other next month. I'm super duper excited about that. We're talking about diversity. Or even worse, what if you have a situation that you are diverse but you don't have inclusion on your team. That's even worse. Diversity is easy. All you gotta do is go hire somebody that doesn't look like you, talk like you, act like you, walk like you, that's pretty easy. But the work begins with inclusion. Now I thought about approaching this here with an awful lot of fancy data and all of that, but it's no need for that. I'm gonna try to make this as personal as possible and invite you into my life and to do that, I'm going to go back to Christmas time, which is a happy time, hopefully for everybody. I'm going to share a picture with you. And I want you to answer the question for me. What do you think about this picture? Everybody should see my screen. Yeah, I bet y'all didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> Very nice. I think the chat function is off. I don't know if y'all have the ability to come off mute, and, but hey, we can have a conversation. What do you see wrong with this picture? Over to the right of this picture is my son, Christopher, and to the left of this picture is my beautiful niece, Amy. She's from Colorado, Denver, Colorado. And her and her family, we had the pleasure to have them as guests in our home two Christmases ago. And I'm sitting there watching TV. And I see this picture. He's talking to somebody. He's talking to me in this picture. And I'm asking him for his awareness. I say, son, do you see anything wrong with this picture? Look at your cousin, Amy. See anything wrong with this picture? This picture is diverse, but I am highlighting inclusion for you. If you have never not been included, you really don't understand what inclusion is about. So this talk is about hopefully to help you get some type of empathy or sympathy if you've never been in a situation where you really have been excluded and can appreciate that. If you have that awareness, anytime you see a picture like this, it should force you to act. When I think about police officers, they are here to protect and serve. I talk about scrum team because I am a scrum master. I like that, that position most because it fits in line with my values. As a scrum master, my job is to protect and serve. I don't have a gun. <laughs> I don't have any mace. <laughs> all I have at my at my disposal is servant leadership. That's all. I, that is my weapon of choice, and I love it that way. Because if I use that properly, and if I'm truly in acting servant leadership and what that looks like, everybody around me is going to take their lives and be better people to the next level. Growth happens. Project managers, agile coach, managers, whatever you may be, I think we all have some element of to protect and serve in our job description or somewhere in that spectrum of what we do. It's easy for us to see as parents and with our own family intimately, but let's take this and expand on it. What if this is your scrum team and you at an event like sprint planning? You have little Amy not giving her contributions. Is that a problem? Yes, that's a problem. Because we never ever going to create a robust outcome, a robust outcome, if everybody's not included. If everybody's not participating. Again, this picture is diverse, but not too inclusive. How do you change that? What would you do? Anybody want to offer a solution?
Well, what I did, as soon as I saw this picture, I knew I had to do something as you would, I can imagine. I mean, really just look at her. Let's just take a moment, step back and look at Amy. She is intently engaged and Christopher opened up this box, this lighted box. That is kind of like a little light, crazy stuff. And <clears throat> she actually looks sad, as you can see. Christopher don't know. He's a child. He's 12 years old. So yeah, I wouldn't expect. He just opened his Christmas gifts. And we bought her and her other two sisters some Christmas gifts. And she had already opened those. But I'm sure this is a wow factor for him because he's opened up a lot of cool stuff she's never seen before. So I talked to him. I said, hey, ask your cousin, which one of those toys, anything else? That's just one room. He got plenty of rooms of stuff. You see, he looked at me like, huh? <laughs> what you say, dad? I said, ask Amy, what does she want of anything that you got and give it to her? Huh? That's the look you see it on his face. I just told him to do that. So what she wanted out of all of those packs, actually it's not even there on the floor, <clears throat> what she wanted. She actually wanted something real simple. It was almost like putty. That's all she wanted. Meanwhile, he went to his room crying. I took a picture of how happy she was. I went to his room while he was crying. I said, son, why are you crying? Dad, you took my gift. You made me give my gift away. I say, isn't that what servant leadership is? In this household, that's what me and your mother, we teach you. We teach you to be like Jesus. Give people your best. Don't give them your leftovers. Now, if it was up to him, he probably would have gave her something like, I don't know. I, I can't even see anything that he would have given her in that picture. But it was, it certainly would have been his best. Then tears start to dry up from his face. I see what you're saying, dad. So yeah, always give people your very best. Don't give people your leftovers. So I took a picture, I went back in the room, I took a picture of how happy she was sitting in a chair at the next slide, which I'm not gonna show you. I want, you, I want this picture to sink into your mind. I took a, went back out in the living room. I took a picture of her, how happy she was, how engaged she was. And she just bouncing off, jumping on the chairs, jumping on the countertop, this and that, the third. She just super duper happy, y'all. I took a picture, I went back in his room. I said, look at this picture. Showed him that picture on the phone. And now his whole demeanor just changed. He's like, dad, I did that. I'm like, yeah, son, you did that. Came back out of his room. And we all had a wonderful day after that. Diversity does not necessarily equal inclusion. We need everybody to do their part. I wish I can hear your voice at this coffee table we having, you having your coffee and I'm having my water. This is not complicated stuff, y'all. It's very easy to see this if it was while our own family. Let's take this to our team. What do I look for as a scrum master? If I'm at sprint planning, I'm making sure that the product owner is coming and not with telling the developing team what to do, but with an objective, an idea of what we're going to get done. I'm making sure everybody playing by the rules. I'm making sure this team environment is safe for everybody to unleash their potential so that we can build the best and most robust product humanly possible like Tesla. If I'm at something like Sprint Review and I see, let's say a lead developer is the only one demonstrating all of the team's product, I have a problem with that because that's like Amy sitting there on the floor watching everybody else work and enjoy the sunshine of what the stakeholders might be offering as feedback. Oftentimes in meetings, you pretty much have one person dominating the conversation. Think about how Amy feels. I gotta go, I gotta go to a mandatory meeting and hear Christopher talk most of the meeting. I'm sitting there like Amy. Most of my career has been like Amy. Which I'm thankful for because it gives me a a high sense of empathy when it comes to people. It makes me not take things personal. 
because they've never been not included. You don't know what it feels like. Don't know how to spot it. Or you just too busy, too being, too busy being you and your ego so big, bad that you can't just calm down and just see right what's right before you. So after this speech, I want y'all to think about the Amy's of the world. I hope that you will have a keen eye to really look for that in your environment, in your teens, because if you never get Amy engaged, I promise you, you would never ever have a robust outcome. You will be, be like artificial intelligence now. You will be like facial recognition now. It's only 80% good, but yet you making that product for everybody in the world to enjoy but yet only 80% can enjoy it without creating other problems and potentially death. I really believe if I would in that airport that day, the guy would have been in jail and who knows what, because in his mind, he simply thought he was being discriminated against. Now, I think it's a great time to have these conversations because I wish somebody you know, in my company and organization would have asked me, hey, you know, when George Floyd, that case happened, a lot of things was unveiled. I wish somebody would have had the courage to have a conversation with me and say, hey, Scott, I really want to get to know you and your culture better. Yeah, though we all have the same emotions, fear, anger, things like that. We all have the same emotions. I remember that day, I, I, you know, the trial was going on. Me and my family talked about it. I went for a walk in the park that day. If somebody that didn't know me asked me how I felt, I was scared. So scared that I went walking in the park that day, like I always do. I take my evening walk. And just to be honest with you, be real with you. Again, we having coffee here. This is you and I talking. I want you to know me and I really want to know you. I've spent an awful lot of time knowing you. But I just want you to take a moment and take a moment. Take a minute and take a moment to get to know me. You have no reason to fear me or people that look like me. We have given you no reason whatsoever to fear us. Anything you fear, how you overcome that fear, deal with it. Approach it. So back to my walk in the park on that day when the conviction was made, I was super duper scared as I mentioned to you. Why was I scared? Every white person I saw I really feared for my life. I've never had that experience in my life. I've seen a lot of stuff, y'all. I've heard a lot of stuff. You know, the pandemic made y'all aware of what goes on to with my people that look like me. But again, that was a day in the life of my life before the pandemic. I have to, before I have to go into an office, I hear about somebody else getting killed, something crazy, just like you hear on TV and all that other stuff you saw. That's normal. That's normal news for me. But you know what? Before I go in that office, I have to clean my face and go be like Amy and hear about Billy Bob or Jane dominate the conversation. Never ask me for my input. Never ask me how I'm doing. But we teammates, supposedly. Back to my walk. How did I overcome that? I walked around the track one time. I was scared to death. In my mind, I'm thinking, I, I don't feel right. I'm just, it's just, just too much. It's just too chaotic out here. I think I'm just going to go home. I just don't feel safe. I, I've never had that feeling y'all before. I walked around the track the second time. You know, I started praying to God, God, you're going to have to help me through this. Oh my God. I mean, I, I'm trying to get these 10,000 steps in today. Y'all, I'm trying to get my, you know, my steps in. And I'm nowhere near completing my goal for the day. And these white gentlemen still sitting over there on the lawn. Why is these white gentlemen I feared so much? Because he's the same white gentleman that ran the black guy down in Atlanta where he was just taking a walk in his neighborhood and shot him in the back. These guys look like those guys. See, when you have an image in your mind, folks, you can't ever unsee something that you've seen, unfortunately. So about the third time I walked around that track talking to God and I said, okay, cool. I had to remind myself all the things I've learned, all the things I've gone through. How do you deal with fear? Face it head on. So I went over there and talked to those three white gentlemen. Say, hey, how y'all doing, sir? How you doing? My name is Scott Adams. How y'all doing? Y'all new around here? You know, again, I started making conversation. And they were super duper nice. 
We sat there and talked for about an hour. See how I overcame my fears? See, I had prejudged them based upon what I'd seen on a picture that had absolutely nothing to do with them. That happened in Georgia. Here we are in North Carolina. But I judged them. And I even told them in that conversation, look, can I be honest with you, gentlemen? I said, I walked around. I, you know, y'all probably saw me looking at y'all straight. You know, every time I walk, you know, I, I'm like looking behind my back, you know, seeing what's going on. I said, I apologize for that. I said, it's just a lot going on right now. I, you know, I, 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 and you know, we had a, a great conversation all because I was willing to face my fears. And I even told him in that conversation, I said, you know what, man, I have a million more reasons to fear you than you have any reason to fear me. But yet, I get treated like Amy. I just want to be included. I just want to participate. I just want to add value going back to our definitions. 9.58, we have two minutes for this discussion. In my abstract, I did say I'm going to give you some tools that will help you have these conversations. These conversations are difficult, they're not easy, but when you go through it, I've never been in a situation where you have conflict and things do not grow. Unless you have conflict, things will not go grow. Think about your own relationship. If you never had conflict in your relationship, oh my God. I mean, like, you know, y'all just on a rocky foundation, just ready to crumble. But it is through that, that conflict that it takes the, the relationship to a whole nother level. So I challenge you to be open to that. Liberating structures is the most powerful thing that I've ever seen when it comes to facilitating these type of discussions. The one I've used for this speech is called is number nine and it's called what, which I identified some of the problems that has gone on over this past year, i.e. the pandemic, stay at home, injustices. So what is the second part of that structure? Okay, what data do you have? Like I said, I could have given you all kinds of fancy data, but no, I'm gonna make it personal. I'm showing you in the life of my family, Amy and Christopher. If you want more data, ask Google like I did. Does facial recognition recognize black people? Again, 40 million hits. Plenty of reading to do if you really want to know. And then the final and the third last piece of that is now what? In conclusion, now what are you going to do? What are we going to do to try to help and resolve this problem? It's not going anywhere, y'all. What, so what, now what? Liberating structure. There's 31, 33 of them actually. I've never had to use anything else once I discovered those to help me to facilitate and land in a beautiful place for robust outcomes. Robust means an object or system that's strong, unlikely to break or fail facial recognition, robust. I thank each and every one of you for your time. If I can ever be of assistance to you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My name is Scott Adams and I hope you got something out of this. Have a beautiful day.